meeting of the Human Resources Committee work session to order. And uh, I'm going to entertain a motion for us to enter into executive session. Um, oh, geez. This is, I apologize. Um, Second page. Yes. Uh, move that we enter into the next session to discussion of employment, particular individual um, matters which will impair public safety. This close any matters which. Oh, I'm sorry. This is a whole different. Basically, yeah. Basically, it has to do the medical, financial, credit, or employment history of a particular person or corporation. Or corporation. Second. <laughs> I guess I need that meeting. For matters leading to the appointment, employment, promotion, promotion, discipline, suspension, dismissal, or removal of a particular person and or potential litigation. And potential litigation. Uh, all in favor? Okay. And uh, so we have some uh, time sensitive uh issues to discuss in uh in exact session and we will try to be as efficient as possible and be back as quickly as possible so talk amongst yourselves <laughs> <laughs>
Association for more than 600 teachers and service providers. Thank you for putting time on the agenda this evening to acquire some information we would like to share with you regarding teaching positions, resignations, and overall feedback on current teacher working conditions. Before our presentation this evening, I wanted to take a few minutes to speak broadly about a topic and then narrow in on that topic, as that's the purpose of the sharing this evening. Before the pandemic, which started in the spring of 2020, we knew of current trends and forecasts of the state of education, particularly with college students enrolled in education programs to become teachers. We were seeing college and universities ending their classes for minors in education, and even seeing our large scale state universities of schools of education closing down their programs. We knew that there was going to be a teacher shortage in the field in years to come. At the same time, our state pension system said that 30% of all of the active teaching staff were eligible to retire within a little more than five years, so around 2025 or so. Then a pandemic happened, which increased the rate of teachers eligible to retire at a much faster rate due to their eligibility as uh, with their age. These are mentioned because we knew that the teacher uh, shortage was forecasted. Nationally, there's been increased discussions and topics focus on this topic. Our national affiliate, the National Education Association, has stated that to solve the teacher short shortage, we must make the profession attractive. Our other national affiliate, the American Federation of Teachers, has stated two-thirds of all school districts are experiencing shortages, and only 13% of active teachers are completely satisfied with their job and the teacher shortage will last until pay increases or standards will have to be lowered. Ironically, we've been having to do that here locally for the last few years with non-certified individuals. Recently, there's been a federal congressional bill introduced for a minimum public school teacher salary of $60,000. We are currently at forty. We alone can't control or make things happen at a national level, even politically. Even though we do a lot of advocacy, we know those things move slowly. I mention these statistics, not because that's what we're talking about tonight, but to say that it's acknowledged and we know that it exists. But at the same time, we can share and speak and discuss what is happening right here at our own local level in our own school district, which everyone in this room and on the screen cares passionately about it. It is here at our local level that we can immediately discuss and start working together for the sake of our schools and our students. Although all data may never be nailed down, because Bob and I know there's different ways of categorizing and different situations, the data that I have today that the, that the ITAF has collects is that since the, since the end of 2021 school year, so June of 2021, we've had 94 voluntary resignations of teachers and student service providers. This does not include in my number any retirees that were eligible for retirement under that eligibility, 
and does not include those who submitted a resignation from their teaching position to attain an administrator position. That number is just purely resignations for our colleagues to take teaching positions elsewhere, or in some cases, yes, to leave the profession. We don't want to continue to see our colleagues from year one to 26 leaving us. One of our beloved colleagues, who we saw this summer resign, was very knowledgeable and did extensive research on quality schools. Remind us as IT leaders all the time that the quality school districts are not based on wealth, curriculum, supplies, or even new facilities. It's consistency in staff that makes it that way. It is here at the local level that we can address our current trends of resignations and our current teacher climate and rail satisfaction and working conditions. We know that there's no such thing as a perfect survey. Every survey will get critiqued. Even the experts that make them will get critiqued. But the information that comes from any survey, such as one that we put together, you may nod in agreement because you might already know some of it. You may tilt your head in wondering and have questions. You may be even resistant to accepting maybe what it says. Regardless of your reaction, information can be used so we can see what it says and what it doesn't say and we can start working together to form a pathway to figure out how to categorize, plan, and find solutions. This evening, you have some passionate and energetic teachers and ITA members here to share the information with you that's been collected. This information is just something that you're going to be able to read and digest, but that's actually not the most important part. The most important part is what we're going to do with it. You won't be able to respond tonight, and we understand and respect that. However, I do look forward to future conversations as we continue to address the staffing of teachers here in our district, not with just short-term solutions of MOAs, but long-term solutions, as we need to be sure that the students in our schools are getting the best education, the best staff, and the best learning environment that they deserve. Thank you. Uh, else? Uh, yeah. You. There. Next item on our agenda is uh, Ladira and Rob uh, Bob Van Curen are going to very briefly give us some uh, updates on exit interviews <laughs> and staff. <laughs> I'm going to turn it over to you to do the exit interviews, and then I will, uh, as expeditiously as I can, move through recruitment and retention, and then uh, thank you so much. Hello. Um, so I have a quick update on the exit interview. So we are currently um, exploring um, adding the exit interview um, as we're digitizing the, the onboarding process, also including that as an offboarding process through school front, um, which will allow for us to send out an exit interview prior to the employee leaving the district. Um, also in that process, looking at um, the current questions that we ask um, right now. So um, um, changing those questions um, may be resulting in uh, better results. Um, it's also going to be a way for us to track those exit interviews. Um, so yeah, some more to come on that. Thank you, Adam, for your comments earlier. It's good to see so many people here, both online and in person. This is a lot of people for HR today, so thank you for being here and look forward to collaborating with you and our other union colleagues as well as we move forward. Um, maybe we do something like this quickly to a standing a standing uh, agenda item. Um, just a quick review at the beginning. Um, I just I'm not going to read this. It's you know we'll be able to uploaded at some point for public consumption. But I do want to take a moment to just sort of um, talk about items that ICSD has paid attention to. We've heard items uh, of 
importance from our staff, faculty, and the broader community. It's been over a long period of time too, but it might just inform you know some of some of the recruitment and retention efforts and challenges that we've had. So we ICSD, the community, supports small neighborhood elementary schools. Um, I think about 14 years ago, there was an economic downturn, even Cornell had some people up. And there was a meeting much like this where we momentarily talked about potentially closing one elementary school. And I swear, before we got out of the meeting, the t-shirts were already printed, save our school. And so it was really a good reminder that uh, small neighborhood elementary schools are very important for this district. Multiple boards since then and the administration uh, has stuck to that promise to keep them open. We also have really good class sizes here, small class sizes. And currently 16, a little over 16 uh, uh, people, students per elementary class on average. Now, studies have not always correlated small class size with uh, increased student achievement. But our administrators, teachers, education support professionals, parents and caregivers have all said, we want small class sizes. Um, that adds to the staffing challenges because in other districts, with larger elementary class sizes, you need fewer teachers, fewer support professionals, fewer administrators uh, to run the schools. Um, we do have a significant number of teacher support professionals in classrooms in ICSD. I think this is, especially when we were in negotiations, uh, both with ITA and the Para Association Union, it became pretty evident that ICSD far outpaces uh, districts in our region and even multiple regions when it comes to uh, teacher um, support professionals in the classroom. Um, what other districts don't do, either they can't do it or they won't do it, we do it. And when I say we, I think I should take a moment to say who the we are. The we is all of us. Ithaca prides itself and has uh, engaged in a real good collaborative effort with the unions. Um, we've settled multiple six-year contracts with our union officials through collaboration. That wouldn't happen if there isn't good collaboration between the district and the union uh, leadership. Um, at times, the easy thing would have been, at times, challenging times, economically challenging times, would have been to cut supports, increase class sizes, cut administrators, but our community rallies whenever we ask them to. And we have gone over the tax cap uh, at least twice in, I think, 10 or 12 years here. Um, and they pass by you know 70 percent or more typically in our budget so that's a real indicator from our community that we, we also that they support you we support the broader community and our district um, there are also lots of course offerings at ihs and lacs um, there are courses not offered in many high schools in our country certainly not in our state um, I have chaos and fractals uh, running around there. We have Latin and Mandarin programs. Uh, Facing History at LACS was a fantastic program. My son was there, he participated in it. Um, environmental courses. So we offer a tremendous amount of courses to students in our high schools, often leading to the low class, small class sizes. Uh, and again, that has impact on staffing. We also have many extracurricular offerings. I think over 100 clubs at IHS alone. Um, and I would be remiss, I got to say this, it's not anywhere on that chart. Um, we have a very complex but responsive transportation system. The transportation that we do with our school bus drivers in this district, uh, I would put against any size district anywhere. Um, we also have the culture of excellence, uh, the poster behind us. Uh, and I remember sitting with pre previous boards for many, many meetings and teachers who come, administrators who come, every word in, in that poster was painstakingly reviewed and uh, 
discuss. Um, and that's really all of us as teachers, education support professionals, administrators, all working towards that goal. It's not just a poster in Ithaca. We've embraced anti racism and culturally and linguistically responsive teaching. Um, maybe this is a good reminder too. Our student population, 37, roughly 37% of our student population identifies as students of color. Our teachers, um, this is another area which Adam and I have discussed many times, the national and state shortage of um, teacher applicants into teaching schools uh, of color is dramatically low. Currently, as Gladira, I think, mentioned maybe a month ago, we presented to the board uh, so nicely. Um, our teaching staff is about 11%, a little over 11% identified identifies as teachers of color. Our staff more globally is at 17%. So there's work to do, but the, this district, in collaboration, when I say the district, that's all of us, um, has really paid attention to and worked hard to embrace these goals and support goals. Um, you may know Tompkins County, culturally, ideologically, politically, as I think Adam had mentioned, very much diverse. Um, you don't have to look any further than when we have a state or federal uh, vote and the difference in Tompkins County versus anywhere else in New York State until you get to the major metropolitan areas. We've all chuckled at the bumper sticker about reality and being surrounded by it. Um, there's a lot of support in our community, but it's not for everyone. So an uh, added item impacting staffing and ethics up is you know, our ideology that we embrace here and what we teach our students and the manner that we go about conducting ourselves isn't for everyone. And there are some folks who I don't know what they think necessarily because we don't hide it. We don't hide who we are. But I think some folks get here in whatever job, administration, teacher, even bus drivers, who think, well, I can be, I can be a teacher like I can be a teacher anywhere else. I can be an administrator like I can administrate anywhere else. I can drive bus like they do in many other districts. That's not, those folks are not going to be uh, allowed to do that here. And it's not just administrators who call them out, it's their fellow colleagues, fellow teachers, like, hey, we don't, we don't do that here. Um, so other challenges, uh, and we did perfect on um, the national, state, regional teacher staffing shortages. Uh, I agree totally. There has to be a multi-pronged approach. Um, it's going to need federal and state governments to come together. It's going to have to be collaboration between unions and districts, between our unions and us. Um, they're not separate entities. Uh, as I mentioned, we would not have been able to settle multiple six-year contracts with our unions if there was a disconnect in what we feel is important. So that's really a really powerful number. Um, we have to find a combination of programming, money, benefits, supports that intrigue people to enter into our profession in the first place. That's both nationally, statewide, and locally. Um, other challenges. Um, we have not shrunk our staffing, even as the population in our district uh, has gone down over the years, not as dramatically. Uh, thankfully, as other upstate, small upstate New York cities, but we have lost population. We've actually expanded our staffing uh, population. We've added bus drivers and bus routes. Uh, in the past few years, we've added 11 special ed teachers. Uh, and not coincidentally, I don't think, that's roughly the same number of special ed teachers that we're having trouble filling. So in a way, we, again, all of us, We've asked the, the taxpayers to support our budget, knowing that we're going to increase teacher sizes, even though population is uh, going down. Um, it requires us to find people to fill those positions. And sometimes 
that's been a challenge. It has definitely been a challenge in the special ed area. Um, and it affects not just teachers. I, don't, I, don't, I appreciate so much teachers being here tonight. I know we're going to talk about the district and the teachers. But as I traveled uh, over the uh, holiday break in New York State, you couldn't drive more than a few miles. You'd see the electronic signs, snowplow drivers wanted, buy it, I'm not going to say where to apply. Um, every truck that passed me almost had hiring drivers, and it would even list what the salary and benefits were. So those folks compete with us for our CDL drivers uh, and busing. And so I just, I just think it's important for that type of interplay to be recognized. Um, we also have really a long-term standing practice and, and collaboration with teachers to allow partial leaves much more so than other districts would do. Um, we have teachers who, who work, you know, 0.8 and take 2.2 .2 leave. We have some that work 0.6 to 0.4 leave. We have been had occasion where they took 0.8 leave and work 0.2. Now, that's fantastic. That works for both of us. It helps them. Oftentimes, they go um, try, you know, teach at the college, collegiate level and come back. Um, they've gone to other countries <coughs> to hone their skills. So it's not something we complain about, but their position has to be backfilled. And it's often hard to hire a teacher to fill a temp what will be a temporary position. Now we've we filled those holes often with what we might see as 0.167s on board reports and oftentimes people are like, what, what is that? So that's the equivalent salary amount of teaching one extra course at the secondary level. And it's essentially 16.7% added to your to your base salary for doing that extra course. It's not something that we want to rely on either, either, either the district or the teachers here because it's tough. That, was, that extra class, um, that's not easy to do. Uh, some folks have even done a couple extra classes. We appreciate them so much, but it's again not something you want to do as a long term solution. Um, and finally, we, we also have a strong record of promoting our teachers, both the teacher on special assignment roles in the district, which you wouldn't necessarily find in districts our side to the extent that we do it, and then also promoting them into administrative work uh, when that becomes available. Uh, so these things add to the staffing constraints uh, we have. Um, but, you know, people are what makes it thrive. And people, all of us, uh, have ICSD thrive. So I'm looking forward to working collaboratively with the we all, uh, Dr. Brown, the board. We're looking collaboratively working with all of our unionized uh, colleagues and union leadership uh, to recruit and retain uh, everyone who supports ICSD's vision and mission. So I said a lot, appreciate the time. We turn it back over to Moira. Okay, thank you, Bob. Okay, so next we have a presentation from the ITA Solidarity <laughs> Committee. And um, I'll ask you folks to introduce yourselves. Uh, before that, I just want to uh, say, since we are talking about employment, employees, people who have worked in the district or are working in the district. Uh, oh, okay. We need to be cognizant of the fact that uh, the board has a policy of not mentioning individual names in a public presentation. Uh, so I just want to remind us all of that and, you know, that if somehow that pitfall is fallen into, we're going to need to stop and regroup at another time when we have a plan for how we can stick to that policy, which we find very important. So, take it away. 
Okay, hi, I'm Aurora. Uh, I teach at LACS, um, and I'm the uh, chair of the Solidarity Committee in the ITA, and along with my colleagues here, Catherine and Adam and Amanda and Raphael, um, and a few other committee members, we've prepared this presentation for you all. Um, so this presentation is on morale and retention in ICSD, according to teachers. So, oh, sorry, there we go. All right. Um, so we started this um, sort of wanting to present back when we started thinking about doing an exit interview. I'm excited to hear that ICSD has an exit interview, but everyone we talked to, nobody had actually received an interview. Um, and, and we thought it was really important to do an exit interview. We thought that we should do it since it didn't seem like others were. Uh, and the reason was that high turnover in ICSD feels like a crisis. So yes, there's issues with recruitment, but there is also issues with retainment. We see our colleagues leaving and it feels bad. Um, one building in our district had over 50% turnover in the past two years. We have over 30 teaching roles in ICSD that are filled by uncertified teachers right now. Um, and, and we thought that if we want to understand why this is happening, the respectful thing to do and the way to really understand what's happening is to ask, why are folks leaving? So what we have here, this is just, um, of course, you know, Adam laid out really well that this, there is a national teacher shortage. But we uh, have been feeling, and the data supports, that there's also an Ithaca-specific teacher shortage. So what we have here um, is some data that we gathered. We found the total number of teaching positions in these um, surrounding districts from the state report card website. And then we looked at their job listings um, from their HR websites. And what we found is Ithaca, you can see, is at the bottom. And <laughs> it's a little Sorry. hard to say with the bar. No, you're OK. Um, you can see that Ithaca is, um, in January of 2022, was at 6.3% open positions, which is like way more than every other district um, that we have listed here. And in December, you know, Syracuse is in close second, but Ithaca still way more openings than uh, the surrounding districts. So this is an Ithaca-specific problem in addition to the nationwide problem that we're all facing. So that's why we thought we should do an exit interview. Uh -oh. No, but it's not my turn. The chair. Oh. Uh-oh. Oh, sorry. Yeah, but I'm not sharing my screen. I don't know. The, the button. Oh, there we go. Okay. So, uh, what did we find when we did the exit interview? Uh, this obviously has way too much information on it as a slide, um, but I bolded a few words, like primary reasons for leaving from exit interviews. There's lots of stuff. Um, people have all sorts of reasons for leaving. Nobody mentioned leaving for love, but people did mention self-care, low pay, burnout, feeling like they were bullied, treated poorly, mental and physical health. Um, and we have here just kind of, we, so we've only conducted uh, 14 of these interviews so far, but we are going to keep going. And we found seven out of 14 people mentioned self-care, burnout, mental and physical health. We heard three people mentioning low pay, three people mentioned student behavior and lack of consequences for those behaviors, three people or two people mentioned lack of support, three mentioned bullying and mistreatment, two mentioned losing community, Two said they were frustrated with building level systems and organization, and three um, mentioned poor communication. So these um, are kind of our summaries based on their comments. But you have in your packets like all of people's direct words, so you can read at your leisure the, the long slide that says everything. Um, Obviously, 14 people are not representative of everyone in ICSD, every employee in ICSD. So we really, we wanted this presentation to be actionable and we wanted it to be relevant. Um, and we thought the real question, right? Some folks have already left, those 14 people have left. Um, but what about those who haven't left? How are they feeling? Um, how are they experiencing their working conditions in the district? Um, so what we decided to do was a second survey that was about morale and retention um, with all of the ITA members who are still with us in the district. We asked three main questions. What brings you joy in your work? What drains you? And what supports do you need? And we had 151 members complete the survey, so that's about 23% of the union. Um, and I, I picked out this quote because I thought that it 
it did a really good job encapsulating how many teachers are feeling. So this teacher wrote in the survey, I have been a classroom teacher for 20 plus years and I see public education as my life's work. Still, I look at job listings every day because I can't sustain my morale and energy level. I am beyond burned out. It shouldn't be this way. I love teaching. I'm drained and see no options other than starting over in a new field. So I'm gonna give some data and also some quotes from this morale survey um, and integrated into it is some of the um, information from the exit interview as well. And all of this data is also in your packets. That's why they're so fast. So it has all the data from the exit interview and from the morale survey. Um, so this question, uh, we had some pre-filled in answers that came from the exit interviews and from discussions in Rep Council. And people could check boxes and then they could also type in an other. So you can see at the bottom there were 12 unique write-in answers that are in your packets as well. So um, this question, what brings you joy in your work? Vast majority of us find joy with our students, of course, that's not surprising. Um, our coworkers bring us joy. Um, families and the community, flexibility and freedom in my classroom, and the full answers are written out in your packet as well. Um, and some folks are really appreciating their administrators and the district's mission and vision as well. The next question, what drains you? Um, this one, we had 44 write-in answers in addition to all of the boxes that people checked. So um, this suggests to me like there's a lot of things that are draining a lot of people um, and, and it's hard to read here. So I just have a second slide that kind of lists the top five in order. So number one, most draining thing for teachers, um, understaffing of buildings. So lack of TAs, lack of co-teachers, et cetera. That was 66.2% of people um, said that that was a huge drain on them. And I'm thinking about what Bob was saying about, you know, there's more um, special ed positions and that's like leads to some of these uh, openings. But the thing is, if you're a teacher and you're supposed to have a co-teacher and you don't because that position wasn't filled, you're doing two people's jobs. That is a big drain. Um, inconsistent communication, 65.6% .6 of people find this really draining. Um, higher student needs post pandemic, that's in quotes because we're still in a pandemic. Um, social and emotional needs as well as academic needs without needed resources. 63.2% of teachers are feeling this. Uh, disconnect between broad vision and implementation, skills and time. That was 62.3% of teachers are feeling that as a drain. And then the last, there's two things that were tied for, for uh, fifth place, always being asked to do more and student behavior issues. And I think that really the last three, which are really four things, can be summarized into one kind of blanket statement. I, put, I call it high needs, big vision, inadequate implementation. So our students have high needs that we take our students where they are, we love them, and they have a lot of needs that we're not going to change. <clears throat> our district has a big vision, right? We want to do really radical things. We want to change how education works, and we don't want to change that either. Implementation is where we actually have some power, right? How we implement that big vision to address our students' high needs, that's where it feels like ICSD right now is not um, doing what it needs to do. And that is a drain on all of the people who are trying to implement this big vision for our students who have high needs. So a couple of quotes just around these kind of considering them three main topics. The first, the top one, understaffing of buildings. We have this quote from the morale survey that says, students and teachers in this district are in crisis. We can't continue to fill vacancies with unqualified teachers who exacerbate the feeling of powerlessness. The lack of structure in place for new ESPs is surprising given how much we rely upon them. This district needs to get serious about retaining experienced staff and training new staff. The rewards of teaching can no longer outweigh the incredible cost to our physical and mental health, especially with the grossly inadequate salaries. So we're seeing that people are getting burnt out, they're leaving, and then the folks who stay have more work to do, and they're burning out because of that, and it's a cycle, and we need to interrupt this cycle. Um, the second 
thing, uh, the second big drain on folks was uh, communication. So this orange data is from the exit interview. And um, we, we had ranked choice, I think like I skipped a slide where I talked about how the exit interview worked. But anyway, we had ranked choice, uh, it was like rank this on a scale from one to five, on a number of things. And one of the things, so we have communication in the schools. You can see that um, some people are feeling like communication in schools is going pretty well, not a big problem. Others are feeling like it is pretty, um, it's inadequate or not great. But then if you look in the district level, basically, <laughs> Mediocre at best. Nobody who left felt like communication at the district level was strong. And uh, this quote from the exit interview says, overall, clarity of communication from district admin to building admin is sorely lacking. Teachers must feel like they are heard in a non-adversarial way. District communication and mutual respect was dysfunctional. So that is communication. People are not feeling heard. They're not feeling um, like there's mutual respect. And there's a kind of, I've heard a lot of teachers describe a sort of game of telephone where something comes from central admin to uh, building admin, and then the building admin have to explain the things that they only sort of understand. And it's like, why? Why don't we have more streamlined communication? OK, and then the third thing, which again was like a combo of four things that I'm calling high needs, big vision, inadequate implementation. I have a couple of quotes and then I have some data as well. So here we have um, the two quotes on the left. There's a lot of money thrown at abstract ideas, but it doesn't always trickle down to practical training and execution. And uh, another teacher says there's no follow through with many expensive initiatives in this district. We need to pick one curriculum for an initiative and then stick with it. We are paying a lot of money for a lot of initiatives that don't even touch some of our schools. Anything worth doing is worth doing well. Pick one or two and don't waste the money half doing a bunch of others. So we heard a lot of uh, variations on this theme. Like we're trying to do a lot and none of it's working because of it. Or all of it's half working because of it, which is still a huge drain. Um, and then on the other side, uh, two quotes. The first says, the workload goes up. The feeling that I'm doing right by my kids is going down. As a special education teacher, I feel like people in these positions are taking advantage, are taken advantage of more than is acknowledged. So that's on the special education side of things. And then a classroom teacher says, elementary classroom teacher jobs, elementary classroom teacher's job is not sustainable. 10 years ago it was. Now classroom teachers are responsible for so much. And I think what this shows, right, is that uh, like special education teachers, classroom teachers, everybody is feeling like their jobs have gotten harder. Um, there's more work than can be done and it's, it's impacting our students. Um, so the next two quotes are about specific initiatives that are really important in ICSD and how they're being implemented. So on restorative practices, this teacher says, the inconsistent response to behavioral problems drains me daily. I get hurt by students at my job and it makes me want to quit. Restorative justice does not happen. Neither does a clear disciplinary response. There needs to be something in response to violence and it should be district-wide. And on inclusion, quote, having students who are quite nonverbal, who are hurting other children and who spend all day outside of the classroom is not inclusive for that student or other children. I think we need to relook at our special education practices and have some programs that actually get children the support they need. So something that stands out to me in both these quotes, neither teacher is saying restorative practices don't work or inclusion doesn't work, right? That's not what we're saying. We, we are excited about restorative practices. We're excited about inclusion. We just want to do them well. And when we don't do them well, we're the ones who feel it because we're the ones with kids in front of us who are being harmed. And when you're in it day to day, you can see when things aren't working. And if you want them to work, it, it's hard when it sounds like everyone above thinks everything's going, everything's going well. It's not a problem. Um, and then this third, this last quote on this topic, how does this impact our students? Uh, this teacher says, I need the district to really be about creating this culture of love or culture of inclusivity. 
And I believe the missing piece is actually defining what the, that really looks like inside the walls of the school. Of course, we all love our kids, but is there a communal understanding of what that actually looks like? When kids do things that are, hurt, that are hurtful to our community and there's no follow-up, there's no boundaries, there's no formalized restorative justice practices, I believe the message they ultimately get is that my actions do not matter and I do not matter. So we hear this from teachers a lot that like, by not having all of these practices that we say we're doing, by not having them nailed down, by not really understanding how we're doing them and not doing them well, um, we can see that impact on our students. And that is really draining. The big kind of well, one of the big messages that we saw from our, our um, responses is that we want to implement our mission and vision. We care about the mission and vision of ICSD. We're passionate about it. That's why we work here. However, in the day to day, we lack the time, resources, skills, energy, and systemic action plans to do this work with integrity. So what supports do we need? That was our third question on the uh, morale survey. And I have a few quotes and then I have some uh, data. The first says, I love my coworkers, kids and admins, but I took an 8% pay cut to come here. After a year and a half, I'm further behind financially than ever with no end in sight. I already worked two jobs. I've applied for a third part-time position and may pick up a tutoring job as well. I don't want to leave ICSD, but I may find myself being a teacher with three part-time jobs. So what supports do we need? We need better pay, clear and simple. Um, the second quote says, anti-racism cannot just be implemented at the classroom level. It is institutional change, and as such, includes accountability at all levels. Anti-retaliation policies, income equality, and a requirement for those with power to use it to listen and to uplift all, not just a select few. And the third quote says, a sense that when asked for feedback, or even when not asked, I suppose, board members and admin at every level will actually listen, as opposed to getting defensive or making a comment to the effect that I or we must not be bright enough or anti-racist enough to understand the district vision. This de facto response to almost all teacher feedback to central admin on the past two to three years is maddening, disingenuous, anti-education, and borders on gaslighting, says this teacher. And this is a, this is a sentiment that um, we saw. People are feeling like when trying to give feedback, it's like, oh, if you don't think that what we're doing is working, then you must not want to be doing what we're doing. It's like, no, we want to do what we're doing. That's why we want to do it better. So um, here's some of the data. We had a, um, another drop down menu. 86.4% of teachers say more financial security and better pay is a support that we need to keep doing this job and not burn out. 72.1% want a commitment, plan, and timeline from central admin to fully staff our district and to retain its employees. 59.9% want compensated and comprehensive professional development on the job that aligns with the vision. 57.1% want clear and consistent communication from central and or building admin to staff. 49% want the ability for teachers to give anonymous feedback about administrators. We heard in the exit interviews and we heard um, in the survey that some people love their administrators and some people have a lot of issues and feel like there's nothing they can do about um, feeling like an administrator about any feedback on administrators they have no recourse and that feels that makes them feel powerless and powerlessness is one of the things that makes people burn out um, central admin created committees like the distance learning summer work should be fully collaborative not just for show Results should truly reflect the staff feedback and needs. This 41.5% of people um, check this box. This box we put on because of uh, one exit interview that I actually conducted. Um, I should say all of our exit interviews were conducted um, like by humans. It wasn't just filling out a form, and I think that led to really thoughtful conversations. 
Um, so in this exit interview, this teacher who was an incredible educator, so committed, um, he said he gave up his entire summer working on this distance learning working group. He and many others worked so hard around the clock um, and then felt like none of their work was implemented and the decisions that were made had nothing to do with their recommendations. And that was incredibly hard for him to stomach and eventually led to him wanting to leave the district. It felt like disrespectful and it felt like a waste of his time. Um, so this last one, regular building visits from board reps where they make an effort to talk to staff and students, only 31.3% of teachers checked that box. And, I, and some people actually wrote in the comments why they didn't check that box. They're like, oh, well, they're not going to listen to us anyway. And I think that's a challenge to our board reps, right? Like, prove them wrong. Let's, let's go to these buildings and, and listen and uh, show that, you know, we do care about our teachers and we do want to know how they're doing and we want to know how all of these big policies are being implemented at, um, at the ground level. So in conclusion, teachers' working conditions are students' learning conditions. And when teachers are in crisis, students feel the impact. Uh, we support the mission and vision of ICSD, but we do not currently have the tools to implement them. And our immediate asks, obviously that long list you're not going to be able to implement before the next uh, HR committee meeting, right? But our next, our immediate asks are number one, you have these beautiful packets in front of you. We'd like you to read through all of the responses from our two surveys. Um, and we'd like you to visit our schools and talk to teachers, talk to support staff, talk to students and ask them these, you can ask these same three questions. What brings you joy? What drains you? And what supports do you need? You could ask about specific policies that are really interesting to you. You know, how are restorative practices going? How is inclusion going? Um, and, and I think that that will really enliven and enrich your future HR uh, committee conversation. So we look forward to continuing this conversation with you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Just be done around this time, <laughs> which is great. Uh, That's pretty good. You know, we uh, we really do appreciate what you shared with us, and as Adam mentioned, you know, we're going to need time to really digest it. There's a lot here uh, to digest it, to prove it, to talk about it, and so this is just the beginning of an ongoing conversation and a collaborative approach to the challenges that we face in fulfilling our vision and mission. And it's very gratifying to hear your commitment to that and, and focus the conversation on how do we do that together. Thank you all. Thank you folks. Have a good evening and thanks for staying late. Yes. Yeah, we actually tried to consider rescheduling this meeting earlier, but somehow that just couldn't happen. Thank you.